And we're live. Welcome to another edition of Facebook Live. Uh, let me check to make sure my microphone is working. Um, my name is Tim Van Milligan. Uh, this is a training class for Roxim, which is our software that we sell here at Apogee. Um, what we're doing today is opening this up to your questions. And I'm looking on my screen over here. I got a second monitor right over here. So if, if you see me looking over here, I'm checking that monitor to see if there's any questions that have come in. Uh, we are recording this, so uh, you can always watch it later. And, and if you're not here right now, you obviously are watching this later. So thank you for watching. Uh, we also post these to um, YouTube. Um, so they're also on YouTube because a lot of people get into YouTube a little easier than to Facebook. Um, okay, so our agenda today is um, if there's no questions, um, I've got some questions that other customers have asked throughout the week uh, that we can talk about. Um, but I'm always looking here to those people that are here live because you are the most important ones because you actually showed up for this. So thank you for that. Um, so no questions so far. So, okay. So um, we did have one question um, that came in. Well, the first one anyway was from Chris Britt. He asked about the Jolly Logic shoot release. And on the shoot release, um, how do you set that up in Roxem? Um, so uh, let me talk to you. Uh, we, in, the, in the studio today, we have um, a actual cameraman. And I wanted to tell him um, to plug in the, the headphones into the computer, not into the um, camera. This is Derek. Derek is our new graphic artist. Um, he is has taken over for Matthew, and he's he's doing an awesome job. And, and we're we're training him on helping me in the studio. <laughs> uh, we did have another question from somebody else about what equipment are we using in the studio. So maybe while we got this live screen right now, um, what I want you to do, Derek is to take the camera off the tripod and uh, we're going to go live with the camera. So this is Derek holding the, the camera. Um, and, and show over here on the wall, we got one camera up here. That one's not connected. So uh, what Derek is holding is a camera that's similar to that one. And so that camera, okay, now follow the cord down here, Derek. That cord, we got the output, the HDMI cord for that one goes into this um, connector box right here because the Apple computer that I'm using, because kind of zoom in here, Derek, um, this only has USB-C, so I don't have an HDMI that would go directly into the computer. Otherwise, it would be plugged in direct to the computer. So that is going into this port. Uh, now, here over here is the second monitor. So now that one has an HDMI cord coming out of that also into this port right here. Um, so that goes into the computer. And then this one right here is Ethernet. So this is my signal going out to the world. Um, and then this one right here is my mouse. So that we have a mouse right there. Um, and then the software that we're using is called OBS, which is Open Broadcast Studio. It's a freeware software. So I'll, I'll turn my monitor around and, and Derek will get a picture of the monitor. So you can see right here is the Open Broadcast Studio. So I'm watching down here. I'm looking at my microphone level, making sure that the microphone is always on because that's the one thing I can't see. Um, and then on the other side of the screen, I have Facebook. So I'm trying to see what you're seeing, but what I can't tell is the sound. So um, Derek has another computer. To, now go over here to your other computer, Derek. <laughs> so they have a third computer, another computer in the room that he is monitoring the sound so we can always hear the sound. Now we have to monitor the sound because I'm wearing a lapel microphone, and the lapel microphone has an on-off switch. 
And there's also a little battery in this switch. Um, so if that battery ever, di ever dies, I would never know it unless somebody starts screaming saying, you know, you can't hear what's going on. So now this cord is plugged into the camera that Derek is holding back there. So my sound goes into the camera and then back through the HDMI cord to, to this little box and then into the computer, which is feeding everything. So this computer right here is also feeding the monitors. It's sending out to Facebook and right now its fan is running really hard uh, because we're doing a lot of stuff with this stuff. Um, okay, so that is basically our setup. Um, and as you can see, we are in our studio. Um, we may take the camera off the tripod again so you can see the whole studio. It's a small room. It's, it's probably uh, 10 to 12 feet wide and about 14 feet deep. Um, it's a small room. It's, it's soundproof. When we, when we moved into this building, we did what is called tenant improvements so that make, um, make it an actual studio. Because right behind the wall back here is Interstate 25, which is an, you know, a full-blown interstate with um, over 6 million cars that pass through every month, and including those motorcycles and those big trucks. So it's mostly pretty loud around here, but inside of our uh, studio, it's a lot quieter. Okay, so let's get to Roxham because that's what you're here for. Um, and we got a question from Brian Fox. When I am measuring the CG to enter into Roxham, do I measure it with or without an engine? And the answer to that one is without the engine. Uh, let me show you what's going to go on. I've got actually three versions of Roxham here that I'm running on my computer screen. Let me go over to my computer screen here. Okay, so now you're seeing what's on my screen. Um, I've got, I got three versions of Roxim. Oops, wrong, wrong, wrong screen. So I've got uh, this one right here, which is Roxim build 10.0. No, yeah, 10.1. Okay, and I didn't want to use 10.1 today. I wanted to use. We're going to be doing a bug fix, and I talked about this the last time. Uh, and that's it's going to be Roxim. 10.1.1. Oh man, maybe it is the other one that I need. Um, well, we'll just use what we got. Um, so let me go back to that one. Okay, so that's this one right here. This one has some of those bug fixes that we had. The, the, the maid, major bug fix was on custom fins. So this rocket right here is the Apogee flame or the Dynastar flamethrower. So for those who you aren't familiar with the Dynastar flamethrower, that's what it looks like. Uh, let, me, let me change the decals around so you can see all the decals at once. So you got Dynastar flamethrower. Um, it's a two engine cluster. So you can see that in the back end there's two engines back there. Um, so this has custom fins uh, because it's not a trapezoid or an elliptical shape. So here on my screen you see the, tra um, the custom fins and if I open that up I can tell right away whether I'm in the, uh, my bug fix version and I'm not in the bug fix version because um, I can't expand this screen here as much as I want to. Um, so that tells me that I'm in the old old version, the same version that you're running right now. That's the one thing that we want to fix because it's it's annoying to me and I'm sure it's annoying to you. Um, so I'm not going to do anything with the fins anyway. So we wanted to talk about do you measure with the motor in it or not. So right now if I look at this design Um, so I'm looking at it in the 2D view. Let me um, see if I can move my face over here to this corner because I wanted to see this area right here. Um, this shows the mass of the rocket currently along with its current center of gravity location. 
So now the reason you measure it without the motor in it, because once we load the motors, the center of gravity is going to change. So um, if I go here to prepare for launch and I choose an engine, and I'll just check, check the Estes D12, click OK. You can see right here on my screen, it loaded it into one of them. Um, and then to load the other one really quick, you just click the load all button. And what load all means is load all those engine mounts that are of the same diameter. So now I'm going to click load all. And it, and it picked the diameter from over here, from the 24 millimeter that was loaded. Um, so now I've loaded two motors in there. I'm going to click OK. And now notice my center of gravity has changed. I should have pointed this out first. So the center of gravity, which is right here at 25 inches, before it was up here. So let me unload those motors so you can see it shift. So let me get this out of the way here. Let's see if I can make this smaller. Okay, so you can see down here, our center of gravity is 25 inches, 25.23, so almost 25 and a quarter. If I do a clear all, watch the center of gravity icon right here shift forward. So clear all, you can see it jumped forward. So when you load engines into Roxim, it um, it's already going to account for the weight of the engine. So you don't have to put in the center of gravity uh, before that. Uh, so now if you're adjusting the center of gravity, what you'll do is you want to go here to the CD override tab and we will um, uncheck this and then it's going to use the values that you put into this field right here. Oop, I'm on the, uh, yeah, no, <laughs> I'm on the, <laughs> the coefficient of drag override. We want to go to the mass override. Um, so what we want to do is it says use the values below for all the simulations. So I actually had it checked. Um, so I had a manual override on this design. If I uncheck it, it's going to shift this a little bit to be what Roxim calculates the mass at. Um, it, it didn't change. The mass changed over here, the mass of the rocket. Uh, but then when I shift it, it says it's a user-specified mass. So I screwed up a little bit, but I hope, um, Brian, that you got the gist of that. You don't need to measure it with the engine in it. You want to measure your rocket without the engine installed. Okay, so Scott Warner says, I want to add dual deployment kit to my Zephyr. Do you have a Roxim for that? Okay, so that's uh, one of the questions that Chris Britt asked was, how do you add dual deployment? It's going to be a similar question. Um, well, kind of, sort of. So I'll, let's open a Zephyr file. Um, let me see where my Zephyr is. I'm in my rocks and designs. I'm going down here to Zephyr. It's at the very bottom. Click open. It's going to ask me if I want to save this. I'm going to say no. Okay, so here's the Apogee Zephyr. And if I look at it in 3D, you can kind of see what it looks like. This must be an old file because it's not color. Um, if you look over here on the wall, this is the Apogee Zephyr poster. Uh, that's what it really looks like. Um, so right now, this uh, the Apogee Zephyr is a single deployment rocket. So I'll go back to the, my side view, and we only have one parachute, and that's the P right here. Okay, so now let's first let's take the Jolly Logic situation. The Jolly Logic situation is you you have a rocket, and it has a parachute in it. So here's a parachute, and we want to make this rocket similar to dual deployment. So what the Jolly Logic does, um, it's a little, it's about the size of a 9-volt battery, um, and it's got a little tiny servo in it and a rubber band um, and a little, um, a little pull pin. So the, what the servo does is it pulls the pin um, and it releases the rubber band 
So what, what it does is you, you, you tack it to the side of the parachute, wrap the rubber band around it, and that rubber band, as long as the, it's attached, holds the parachute closed. And so what happens is at ejection, when everything comes out, the parachute is in the middle, but it's reefed by that Jolly Logic chute release. Okay. And then at the, 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 the little gizmo has an altimeter in it also. And at a certain altitude, it's going to release the pin, which releases the rubber band that falls away from the rocket. And then the parachute can open. And so the, the purpose of it is so that the rocket doesn't drift as far. So let me just put all this back in, in the rocket here. Okay, so now how do you simulate that in RockSim? So this is similar to dual deployment, um, but there is no device in RockSim that's called a chute release. So we have to create, we have to mimic it. We have to mimic the effects of a chute release. So what is the effect? So the effect is the rocket separates and now it's tumbling down as two pieces. And it's coming down slower than it would if the parachute was open or faster than if the parachute was open. Now, um, so how do we simulate that without a device in the rocket? So we're gonna trick Roxanne. We're gonna say, let's put in another device that mimics the rocket when it's apart, that it falls really fast. And the device we're gonna use is a streamer. So we're gonna add a streamer into the rocket and make it like a dual deployment rocket. So, um, let me, what I'm going to do here, because I like playing with Roxim Pro, and, uh, no, I'll, let me do it this way. Um, so we're going to go to our uh, Design Components tab, and we're going to find a body tube that we're going to put a streamer in. So we're going to pick this body tube right here, where the parachute is already, and we're going to also add a streamer to that. So we're clicking on a streamer. And it really doesn't matter which streamer you use. Um, I'm going to just use a four inch wide streamer. I'm going to click OK. So it added the streamer right here. And I'm going to go to the general tab and just move it back so it's not on the shoulder of the nose cone. And it can be over the top of the parachute. That's fine. You know, they could be side by side. That's totally fine. Um, so now we have a streamer added, and now we're gonna set up the dual deployment situation. So we're gonna to go to the rocket engines, we're gonna prep it for flight, we're gonna choose an engine. Um, I'm gonna choose, uh, let's go with an H, um, H120 red line. And I don't know what the delay is, so I'm just gonna say 14 seconds. Because, um, well, actually, when you're using the chute release, the engine ejection delay is important. If you're using an altimeter, it's not. Uh, because the altimeter is going to control when the parachute comes out. But when, if you're using a chute release, you're going to use engine delay. Um, so we're going to come back to that. We're going to always, when I always run a simulation and I'm using engine ejection delay, I always pick the longest delay. So the longest from the list was 14 seconds. All right, so I'm gonna load that in there. And you can see down here on the bottom of the screen, which is hidden by my face right now. So let me move my face over to the other side. Um, you see the, the rocket motor is loaded. And you can also see from the back view of the rocket right here that the back of the rocket is loaded with an engine. Now we're going to go to flight events, and when we go to flight events, you'll notice there's two devices in there. There's the parachute, which is the top one, and then the streamer. So now the streamer we want to come out first because that's going to be deployed at engine ejection. <laughs> Derek is, is playing with the camera there and I'm getting kind of freaked out. Is it only one channel? Bit of static. Okay. 
All right, so we're back. Um, so the, the, the streamer is going to be deployed at ejection. So we want to keep that at maximum ejection delay. And then the parachute, which is going to blossom later, um, you can set that in anything. You know, whatever Jolly Logic, uh, there's presets in there from 200 to 1,000 feet. Um, so we're going to choose deploy at an apogee or an altitude of... Um, so now remember, if we're using the... Um, the current version, which has the, the other bug that's in this version, is this right here, where you're putting in an altitude in feet, but it's actually thinking of it in meters. So if we want um, 300 feet, it's somewhere around 94 meters. So I'm going to put in 94 and see what happens. Okay. Um, and then under simulation control, I always leave that starting state. I want to see what we're looking at right here. Um, since this is a big rocket, uh, we want to use a launch rail. Um, so we're going to use an 8-foot launch rail, um, which is 96 inches. Uh, we're launching straight up, so our launch angle is straight up. Launch conditions, I'm just checking what's going on here. So I got, I'm got altitude of 700 feet above sea level. I've got a wind of 8 miles an hour blowing from my left to my right. So on your screen, it will be in the opposite direction. Um, and then I'm going to go to the flight profile and see what happens. So the rocket takes off, or I mean, it launches the, the 2D flight profile. And my face is covering the rocket again. So let's move this over here. Okay, so now you can see the rocket down here. Um, and then you have the launch button over here, and I'll just go ahead and click that and see what happens. And the rocket's taking off. So at four second, 14 seconds after the uh, engine burnout, which is right here in the flight, the, uh, pair, uh, the streamer should come out. So it, if you count these dots, there should be 14 of them when the streamer comes out. So there's my streamer. And I'm looking over here at the altitude. So if we did it right, it should be 300 feet where the rocket starts doing a dog leg to the right. Okay, and we are, we are correct. So you can see the trajectory changed, and it, it's now under parachute, although the icon here is actually showing a streamer. But you can tell by just the, the rate of change, you know, the rate of change is the dots are a lot closer together, so that means it's coming down slower. So actually the parachute did deploy properly and it is coming out and descending. So that answers the question of how do you put in a Jolly Logic chute release in a rocket. Um, so that was the answer to Chris, Chris Britt's question. So now Scott Warner says, okay, I want to do dual deployment to my Zephyr kit. Um, so we're taking this Zephyr, and I, I, I assume, Scott, is what you're thinking is you want to add a payload section to this. Um, so the easiest way is to start adding components. Um, well, actually, Scott's looking for a file. Has, have I done a file with a payload bay? And the answer is no, I haven't done one. It doesn't mean that you can't do one. Um, I'll show you how to make one really quick. Okay, so we're going to extend the rocket. So um, assume this is like the Zephyr, where this is the nose cone, although right now it's a transition. But imagine this is a nose cone, and you have a tube. Okay, and so now to make it dual deployment in the traditional sense, what you'll do is you'll make this portion right here your eBay, and then you'll add another tube for a parachute, and then you have the nose cone on top. So in this kit that we're looking at on the screen, what we need to add is a tube and a eBay right here in the middle. Now the eBay is normally the coupler. So typically, you know, to make it to do the quick and dirty route, you would just add a couple of components, um, a coupler and another tube. 
So where do you add them to an existing kit like this? All right, so before I do that, let me save this file as a new name so I don't override my old one. So I'm going to do a save as, and I'm going to call it Zephyr with eBay. Come on, my fingers don't want to type. I'll click save. Okay, so now, now we have a new name right here. Um, I'm going to go here to the Design Attributes tab, and I'm going to call, I'm going to rename it Zephyr with eBay. And, okay, so it's renamed, and you can see the name took down here. Okay, so now where do we add the tube and the coupler? So I'm going to go to the nose cone right here, and I'm going to add the tube right here, just to the bottom of the nose cone. So I'm going to add a body tube. Click OK, and we need to make this a 4-inch diameter because the Zephyr is a 4-inch diameter kit, uh, which is also known as a 98 millimeter. And I'm looking for a 98 millimeter tube. Um, that's 48 inches long. Um, lock precision, there's one. We'll adjust the length. Okay, so it added it. Let me make this bigger so you can see it. Okay, so here's the tube that it added. It's that blue one. Um, we don't need it to be, right now it's 34 inches long. We don't need it to be that long. Um, on the Peregrine, Peregrine kit, um, Derek, see if you can find the Peregrine, um, see if we have a poster for that laying down there. <laughs> we have all kinds of posters. We er, Occasionally we swap out the posters in the background. Um, it would be red if we have one. No, we don't have one. Uh, the Peregrine quit. I'll go to the Apogee website here. Here's the Apogee Peregrine. And you can see here's what it looks like. Um, so basically the Peregrine and the Zephyr, they're almost identical except for the Peregrine has dual deployment. Um, the fins are a different shape. Um, and it has another tube here on top. And this tube is, um, it's nine inches long. Um, how do I know? That's what the eBay looks like. So we're gonna add this coupler. We can add a switch band if we want. Um, and all this stuff, in these are bulkheads on the side. We can add those. And the sled right here would be added as a mass object. Um, that's what it looks like it's assembled. Um, so this is what it looks like, you know, kind of in a side view is we're going to have the main parachute in the front and the drogue parachute in the back and the eBay right in, in the middle. Um, here's some more pictures of it. Um, I'm looking at the tubes here. And it has two couplers. I'm looking for the main tube. Okay, here's my main tube. So this short one right here is the forward tube where the main parachute is installed. And these two long ones are the bottom of the rocket. Um, that's why this rocket has, the Peregrine has um, a second tube coupler. The, the, uh, the Zephyr also has it over here. Um, you have an 18-inch tube, an 18-inch tube, and then a coupler in the middle. Uh, oh, there's a, here's a shortcut. I'm going to back out of this. I'm going to show you a shortcut because inside of this is already a, a tube coupler and a parachute and that streamer that we added. So I'm going to cancel out of this. Say, save my changes? No. Okay, so I'm going to take this body tube right here. And inside of that body, let's get rid of the streamer. Delete that. Um, we have a parachute and a tube coupler already inside of it. So I'm going to just take that body tube and I'm going to do a right click on it and do a copy. Now I'm going to go to the nose cone up here and I'm going to do a right click with my mouse again and we're going to do a paste. 
And so what it did was it took that body tube that was here originally and added it up here to the front. And it just saved us a lot of time because now we got a body tube, a parachute, and there's a mass inside of there. Um, let's click on that, see what that mass is, see if it tells us, it tells us that it's a shock cord. So it's also got a shock cord. Um, this is why it's good to change the names of things. So this should be called shock cord mass. And if you want to make this screen bigger so you can see things a little better. Um, so I just changed the name of it to shock cord mass so that I, that I can tell here in the parts tree what it actually is. Now this parachute, uh, we have two parachutes in dual deployment. One is going to be smaller than the other. Um, the small one we typically put in the back. Um, so I'm going to go to that one right here. And I'm going to make this one because right now it's a big one. It's 36 inches. Um, I'm going to make that, um, I'll just, I'll call it a 15 inch parachute. So once I click tab, watch the parachute size will change back here. So now it's a small parachute. And I also want to rename the, the parachute so that when we go to the flight events, I can tell them apart. Uh, and this is the only way you're going to tell them apart uh, without running a simulation. So I'm calling it a drogue parachute. And I'm going to click OK. I'll just leave everything. You can adjust it later. You can always come back and change things. So now I have my two parachutes, the small one, the big one, um, two uh, shock cords because we're going to need a shock cord on both ends. Um, and we have the two or we have the tube coupler in the middle. And now on, into that tube coupler right here, I can put in a mass object for the sled and the electronics. So I would click on the tube coupler and it's not allowing me to put a mass object in there. So I'll click up here and I can put it into the body tube. So normally I would put the mass object in the tube coupler. It's not allowing me that to do that. So I'm going to put it into the body tube above it. And let's change the name of this body tube up here to forward. Um, let's call it a payload body tube. I always like to name things so that I can tell them apart later in the parts tree. When people send me designs and nothing has been renamed, it, it takes me another 10 minutes to look at your design to figure out what's going on. So now I know the forward body tube as opposed to these other ones. So I got a, a body tube and then look down here, this one is the aft body tube. Well, where's the aft? Well, I, I figure the aft is down here by the fins. So that's kind of why I renamed parts. Okay, so now into this forward body tube, I want to add a mass object, and this is going to be for the sled and the electronics. Uh, and the, it op always opens up the database unless you unselect it right here. Um, and I always cancel out of the database, and now I'm in the mass object. So I'm going to go to the general tab, and I'm going to call this the sled and the electronics. And I have no clue what this is going to weigh. So I'm just going to estimate it at 100 grams. OK, so right now I put the mass object right here at the base of the nose cone. So we need to move that. And that's where this location comes in. So it's only going to allow me to move it back to the back of the tube. And I can't go any further because it's inside the tube. If I want to go further, I just type in a, num a different number. So if I typed in 24 inches, watch this mass object. Once I hit the tab key, it jumped back here to the, to the back of the rocket. Let me zoom in. So to zoom in, what I did on my mouse is I right clicked on the mouse. And it brings up this menu and I can say zoom in. And I can continue to zoom in so I can see where it's actually located. So now I'm going to go back here to the location slider. And I'm just going to slide it to where I think it was. We're going to where the mass of that sled and of the electronics is located. So about 18 inches, <laughs> right where it was before. Um, so if I like it, I'll click OK. And so now it's in here. And my mass object is located. So now if I want to put in the bulkheads, now those you can do as um, as actual parts. 
So if I click on the, the tube coupler again, because normally the bulkheads are on the tube coupler, but if I come over here to the right side of the screen, you can see I can't attach it to this part. So again, we got to force it to a different part. So I'm going to force it to the forward body tube. And now I can add either a bulkhead or a centering ring. Uh, where's centering ring? Centering ring is up here. Bulkhead is right here. Uh, the difference between a centering ring and a bulkhead is the bulkhead is solid and it doesn't have an internal hole. So you could actually use a centering ring as a bulkhead if you made the inner hole zero. Um, so you could go either way with it. I'm just going to choose bulkhead and it's going to bring up um, a list of bulkheads. Uh, now you can check to see if there's a, a 98 millimeter plywood bulkhead and there is one in there. If there's not, um, you can always add it. Um, let me choose it first. So let me make this screen bigger. The very first time you ever open up a screen, um, they are small. It kind of reduces it to a minimum size. But now from here on out, if I close it, let's click OK. If I come back to the bulkhead, you can see my screen is much, it remembers the size of the screen that you had it at before. So I didn't do anything. Uh, I just wanted to show you that, you know, once you change your screen sizes, RockSim remembers them. So the next time you do it, you open that particular screen, it will remember it. Um, so now I'm on my bulkhead and you can see I'm on the general tab and it's called bulkhead. Um, it's located right here at the front of the rocket. Um, I'm going to take it and I'm going to slide it back, back over here to my coupler. You can see I'm going to zoom in so you can see where it's located. There it is. Um, it shows the outside diameter at 3.90 inches, but now since we're inside of a coupler, actually we got to squeeze it down a little bit. Um, so where do you get that information is how big is that coupler in there? Well, one, if you have the rocket kit and you have the components in front of you, you can just get out a ruler and measure it. Um, I like to use a caliper like this. This is a digital caliper. Um, you get these at um, any hardware store will have them. Um, I think this one came from um, one of those low cost discount ones that it's not known for good quality, although this is actually a pretty good quality um, caliper. And it, it, it has an on off switch and you can just as you slide it, it's telling you exactly to three digits how much the tube coupler is. And it, to measure the inside diameter, and the, you would use this side. To me measure the outside diameter, you'd use that side. Okay, so that's a, a digital caliper. I, I always recommend, these are cheap. Go out and get a pair. If you're using Roxim, you got to have them. That's why I have, I always have a caliper, a ruler, and a scale so I can measure the way things. These are also cheap. You can find them on Amazon. It's worth having. Um, okay, so now on, so the other way is if you don't have the coupler in front of you, what do you do? Well, let me come over here to the Apogee website and I'm going to say uh, 98 millimeter coupler and see if it comes up. There's a lock coupler that came up. Close enough, let's use the lock coupler. So go to the lock coupler. This is for 48 and 98 millimeter tubes. And it will show you the inner and outer diameter right here. So 3.884 will be our outer diameter for the bulkhead disc because it's got to fit. Oh, actually it's got to be the inner diameter. Uh, so 3.814, it's going to have to be just a smidge smaller. So if you make it 3.810, I know it's going to fit. So that's what we're going to make it. We're going to make this number right here. To, to change it, we got to uncheck this, and we're going to make it 3.810, and then hit tab, and you can see, I don't know if you could, if you saw that, but the it shifted ever so slightly smaller than the inside diameter. Here's the coupler is the inner of the these lines. And so it's inside of that. 
by that amount. Um, the ply uh, material is plywood. Um, since it's a coupler, it doesn't have any internal diameter. Um, and the thickness is, this is quarter inch plywood. So that's fine. And the location where I have it, um, I'm gonna zoom original, is, is fine right there. So now we're gonna have a bulkhead. And I'm gonna call this the forward bulkhead. Click OK. So you can see it's right here. Um, now I'm going to do that copy-paste trick again. So I'm going to copy the, the forward bulkhead. So to copy, again, it's right-click with your mouse. Do a copy. Then come up here to the forward body tube. And I'm going to paste it in there. Paste it. And see, now we have two forward bulkheads. And the location right now is they're on top of each other. So I'm going to go and edit this one right here. And I'm going to go to the General tab. And the first thing I'm going to say, do it, I'm going to change the name to Aft eBay Bulkhead. And I'm going to change the location. I'm going to slide it even further. And it's only going to allow me to go to the full length of the body tube that it's attached to. So I don't need to go another four and a half inches. So I'm going to try uh, 23 inches, see where it goes. Oop, I went too far. I'm going to zoom in. So to zoom in, it's right click, zoom in, and then click and drag with your mouse. And that way you can see where it is. So I need it to be right inside of here. So I'm too far, so I'm going to just grab the slider and I'm just going to slide it forward to where I want it to be. Um, and I might change the color too, so that it's a different color. So I'll just make it purple so it, it's different from the forward one. Um, and when I like it, I'll just click OK. So before I click OK, I just want to show you where it is in, in relation to the rocket. I'll click OK. So now I have my eBay with the bulkheads, the coupler. Um, I've got the parachute in front, a shock cord right here. This is our sled and the, um, um, the electronics. And here's our aft bulkhead. Now, if I wanted to put that switch band in the middle, um, I would go over here to this forward payload tube, and I'm going to attach another body tube to this. Um, I don't want to do the copy and paste again, because I'm going to have all these components added to it. So this time, I'm just going to add another body tube. And it's going to be that 98 millimeter tube. So I'm just scrolling down here until I see something that says 98 millimeters. And click OK. And it added it here. It made it really long. And I, the switch band is only about an inch wide. So I'm going to just change the length of this to one inch. You can see that it, it put it in right here, um, which is fine. Um, let me zoom in here. Let me, let me first make this bigger so you can see it. I'm going to zoom in. Um, our eBay is no longer centered because we added another inch to things. So if you wanted to be really picky about your components and where they're located in the rocket, you would have to go back and adjust the position of all three of those items. Um, so here's the coupler. Remember, I'm just shifting it one inch because I added a one inch switch band. So I'm going to the general tab and I'm going to change this. Let me zoom in. So if I move it one inch, so make it from 14 inches to 15 inches, let's see what happens. Uh, actually, I only needed a half of an inch. So it should have been 14 and a half. See, it jumped. See, I'm kind of eyeballing it here. So I got more length on this side than on this side. Um, and since my switch band was only one inch wide, I'm going to split that difference of one half of an inch. So I'm going to make this 14.5 inches. I'm just typing it in. And then I'm going to hit tab on my keyboard. And that's going to make force rocks him to accept the value. Tab. So now it's perfect. I got exactly the same amount of distance on both sides of the switch band right here. So now I just need to shift my, my couplers 
or my bulkheads. Um, so I'll go here to the forward bulkhead, go to the general tab, and then add a half of an inch to that. Hit tab. You can see it jumped here, which is good. We'll do the same thing to the aft one. Go to the general tab. And this one, that's a half of an inch, so it's going to be 22.25. Or did I have made it too far? Oh, I made it 5.5. Five. It should have been 2.5. There we go. Um, the, only, the other component you might want to change is the location of the eBay sled and the electronics. So that's here. Double click on it. Change the location. I'm going to add a half of an inch. So it's going to be 0.6125. You can see that it jumped right there. Click OK. So now we have added the dual deployment capability to the Zephyr. And it's actually done. Um, so now all we have to do is run the simulation. Uh, we already have a rocket motor loaded in there. Um, from our last simulation, it was the H120-RL. I'm going to go here to the Flight Events tab. Or, or prepare for launch. Make this a little bigger for you. Um, and we're going to go to the flight events tab. And we have the drogue parachute. And we have our main parachute. Now they're, they're backwards right now. So we got to change the drogue parachute to deploy at maximum ejection delay. And our main parachute to deploy at altitude. And the altitude we said was going to be 94 meters or about 300 feet. And I'm going to hit tab. Um, everything else stays the same. And our flight profile should look very similar to that last one that we did. So here's our rocket down here. I'm going to click launch. The rocket takes off. It's going up. Gonna arc over, and at 14 seconds after motor burnout, it should pop up. There it is. Now we have the small parachute deployed, and I'm gonna speed things along here by grabbing the slider bar because I'm impatient. <laughs> so I want to get down to close to 300 feet, and then when it gets to 300 feet, that main parachute should come out. The drawing's not gonna change, but what's gonna happen is you're gonna see a dog leg right here you can see all the dots are coming down straight and then it dog legged right here so that tells me that my main parachute has opened and the rocket uh, dual deployment has occurred um, and that's actually a really nice dual deployment flight you can see the rocket stayed within our weather cocking cone see these vertical lines right here this is called our weather cocking cone uh, we want the apogee point of the rocket to stay within that vertical cone because that means the rocket's going more up than sideways. Um, if it starts going sideways, um, that's not very safe. So we put the weather cocking cone to kind of give you an indication of how safe your trajectory is. Um, and then we had dual deployment, and the, pair, the rocket only landed about 123 feet away from the pad. So that's the purpose of dual deployment, is to open that parachute um, so that the rocket doesn't drift as far, you know, so it opens at a lower altitude so that when it does start drifting It doesn't drift for as long of a period of time. So if I um, I can run that same simulation And if I go take the drogue parachute and I say no event Which is means don't deploy this parachute and rerun the simulation exactly the same Let's see that flight profile again um, I'm going to just grab the slider bar down here because I'm impatient. The rocket takes off, it goes up just like before. And what's going to. Oh. Okay, okay, so um, what, I, what I forgot to do was to deploy the main parachute at engine ejection delay. Um, so actually, it went down. I would never 
say that this was a safe flight uh, because it's screaming as it's coming down. So right before the parachute opens, if you want to see how fast this is coming, um, you go here to the details. Uh, my units is not showing up. This is another bug we're going to fix. Uh, but if I look at the velocity, the y velocity in the y direction, the y direction is up and down. Um, I know that this is in miles per hour. It's coming down at 160 miles per hour. So when the parachute opens, what's going to happen to your parachute if you open it at 160 miles per hour? Uh, that parachute is probably just going to shred. Um, I don't know of a parachute. Well, there are parachutes that can withstand it but not a typical model rocket parachute. Um, so to make it safer, um, I'm going to rerun the simulation, um, and I'm going to go to the flight events, and now my main parachute, I'm going to say deploy at maximum ejection delay or at apogee. Apogee is always the best, because at apogee, the rocket is at its slowest point in the flight. Um, so as it goes up, you know, at Apogee, it, it's stopping vertical direction. It may have horizontal direction if it's going sideways, but it has no vertical direction. So that is always going to be the slowest point during the trajectory is at Apogee. So that's the best place to open your parachute because then the forces acting on your parachute are lower. Um, and we want to save our parachute. So I'm going to say, let's deploy at Apogee, and let's run the flight profile again. And on the way up, it's going to be identical. So the rocket takes off, goes up. See how fast that was? <laughs> it's a fast rocket. So right at Apogee, pop, the parachute popped out. Uh, but now the downside of having it pop out at Apogee is look at how far away it's drifting. You can see over here is our range. And you can see it's drifting a long way away. We're at almost 900 feet, you know, 869 feet. So it's a longer walk. So by using dual deployment, we shorten our walk time. So hopefully, Scott, I hope that answered your question. Um, and I know what your next question is going to be. And your next question is going to be, hey, Tim, can you save me that Roxim file? So OK, I will. So I'm going to go to all these old simulations, and I'm going to delete them. Because when you get this file, you only want the last simulation that we ran. Um, so this is now set up for dual deployment. I'm going to go Save. And now I've got to um, put this file somewhere where you can find it. And so I'm thinking, can I upload it to Facebook? Probably not. I'll have to upload it to the Apogee website, and then I'll give you a link. So after we up, upload this video, at the end of the day, I'll put a link either uh, on Facebook and on YouTube where you can download this Roxim file um, so that you will have that there. So that answers Scott's question. I'm trying to find my mouse. So I can go to the Facebook and check, see if there's any other comments here. Uh, James Hellman says, awesome. Um, Scott, if you're still here on the live, um, give me a thumbs up so that I know that I answered your question. Um, OK. So, um, so now, since there is no current question, now I'm going to play. So instead of being in Roxim, I'm going to go into Roxim Pro, which is the next version of Roxim that we're hoping to release. Um, everybody always asks, when's it coming? The answer is always soon. Um, and it's because there's always last minute issues that we have to fix. So I don't want to give anybody a date because you'll be disappointed because we're always going to miss the date. Uh, that's just the nature of software. Um, but I'm going to open this same Roxim file, and I am going to open the design. Let's see if I call it Zephyr with eBay. Click open. I, I lost my nose cone here. I had another question. On, I, I, I posted on Facebook last night um, to the uh, we we did an announcement, uh, just a customer service announcement, saying, "Hey, we were on the Rocketry show." 
um, that was released um, this past week. And if you wanted to listen to my interview with the, the hosts of the Rocketry Show, and they asked me about Roxim Pro, uh, which I'm going to show you here in a second. And somebody asked, I talked about one of the projects I was working on. And the project I'm working on right now is trying to create an ultra lightweight competition design that my I hope my daughters are going to fly. Let me come over here. Okay, so here is my ultralight rocket that I'm working on. I told them on Facebook that I would post a picture. So you're actually seeing this ultralight rocket. Now this tube, I wrote down what it weighs here on the front. So I'm looking at it right here. And it weighs, this tube weighs 3.1 grams. And this nose cone is another 0.7 grams. So we're at around 3.8 grams for the body and the nose cone on this tube and if I add fins the the fins are going to probably add another gram um, so it's going to be about 4.8 grams um, then I throw in a streamer or a parachute so this ultra lightweight rocket and, and this competition is for duration so in duration you want it as light as possible um, so that's what it looks like um, I, I, I wish there was something special about this other than that I made it uh, but other people have been making rocket tubes like this that are even lighter weight than mine. So, and I'm jealous of them and how light they're making them. Uh, but I am just happy as a clam um, that I was able to get it to this point. Um, so I, I still got a little bit ways to go, but I'm having fun with that. So that's why that was there. The nose cone fell off, so Derek picked it up for me. So let's get back to Roxanne. Um uh, Okay, so we are in, where did my mouse go? We are in Roxim Pro. Let me show you my desktop. So it's, Roxim Pro looks very similar to Roxim. Uh, on the design side, it's almost identical. Um, it's on the simulation side that it, it's a little bit different. So here's that same rocket that we just did. It's a Zephyr rocket with an extra eBay on it. Let's look at it in 3D. So it's just a longer rocket. You can't even see. There's that switch band. So there's the rocket. Um, so let's launch, let's see that same dual deployment situation in Roxim Pro, what it looks like. So, because this is the fun part. Uh, so we're going to choose an engine, and I think we had. Let me cancel out of here. Let me go here to flight simulations, the H120 RL. Um, to load an engine really fast, you know, if you just want to rerun a simulation, take your mouse, hover it over the name of the motor over here, then right click, and it brings up this menu, and one of them is load engines. So I'm going to load the H120 RL-14. So now that engine is loaded. You can't tell because you can't see it. But it's down here in the back of the rocket. If I go to the side view, you can see it's loaded. Um, now we're going to go back here. So now it's already loaded. So I don't have to go choose engine and then sort through the list to try to find my motor because it's already loaded. Uh, I can go right to flight events. Um, so here in Roxim Pro, it's a little bit different. The way we create dual deployment events is different. Um, the Drogue Parachute, um, this is the same. This one will be deployed at Apogee, but it's the main parachute that it's different. Um, and the reason why is in Roxim Pro, you can actually deploy a parachute while the rocket is still moving upwards. So if the rocket is moving upwards, and if I set it at 300 meters, Roxim Pro doesn't know if I mean going up or as it's descending, coming down to 300 meters. So I got to throw in some criteria to tell Roxim Pro that it'll be coming down. So the first criteria is that it has to reach Apogee. So I'm going to come here to Apogee and say, yes, it's going to reach Apogee. Um, and then additionally, I'm going to add another criteria. Uh, my uh, to do that, I'll hit the plus sign here, and it says it adds another row below the parachute, 
And now I'm going to say deploy at an altitude. So here I'm going to deploy at an altitude of, let's make this 300 feet. I'm going to hit tab. Okay, so now we're set up for dual deployment like we were before. Um, now we just have to adjust our starting state like we did before. So we're going to be a 98 inch launch rod because this is off of a rail. Um, if we want to go straight up, I'm going to say make this vertical, zero degrees, and watch this uh, slider wheel change ever so slightly. Um, and now we have to change the azimuth angle. Well, since we're going straight up, the azimuth doesn't change. So what is azimuth? Azimuth is our compass direction. So right now, if, imagine this right here is a compass rose. So north would be straight up, south is polar opposite, so it's straight down. East is off to the right, west is off to the left, and we're launching kind of to the northwest, but the rockets aim straight up. So if it was tilted any, then we're actually truly launching to the northwest, but since we're at zero degrees, the azimuth angle doesn't matter. Um, and I'm gonna go here to launch conditions. Now this is where the rocket is launched from. Um, our altitude at the launch site is 440 feet above sea level. The landing zone altitude is also 440 feet. Uh, but you also notice here in Roxin Pro there's a latitude and a longitude uh, because this is where on earth are you launching from because what it's going to bring up is an actual image of the, rock, of the earth with the rocket on the pad. Um, and this one, if you know your latitude and longitude coordinates, um, this is actually in Southern California, um, outside of Los Angeles. So I'm going to hit flight profile and we're going to run a quick simulation. We're running out of time here, so um, we'll just run this simulation so you can see what it's going to look like. Kind of uh, giving a little bit of a teaser on Roxim Pro. And it brought up a window here. And this is, um, it's loading a map of the rocket on the pad. And right now we're zoomed in on the rocket. And if you look at the background, it doesn't look like anything because we're zoomed in too close. So I'm, with my scroll wheel, I'm just backing out. And now all of a sudden you can see some terrain around here. So in this small window down here, which we call the mini viewport, uh, we're still centered on the rocket. Uh, but on the main view, we zoomed out. And so the rocket is right about where my cursor is. So let me zoom back in. See if I can, there it is, right here. Um, okay, so we're in California. Let me zoom out further so you can kind of get a gist of where we are. We're looking, here's a compass down here. So north is to the bottom right. So let me turn the compass around make the compass north and now you can see we're in Los Angeles uh, we kind of lost our rocket so if you lose your rocket you just go to the home button over here so I'm gonna click on home and it goes right back into the rocket so now we're zoomed in close let me back out a little bit and now we're gonna launch so just like in Roxim um, our flight profile there's the launch button so we'll go ahead and click that and the rocket takes off and it goes up and we're tracking with the rocket in both views. We, in the mini port view, we can see a closer up view. Here it's a little bit further away. Look, the parachute popped out at Apogee, starting to drift down. I'm gonna zoom out a little bit so you can kind of see a little bit better of what's going on. These uh, red lines are just kind of, uh, kind of give you an indication of the 3D nature of this. I'm just, holding down my shift key, or my, yeah, the shift key and my mouse button, and I'm just dragging it around so I can see what's going on with this. The green line was the trajectory going up, and then um, the red line's vertical is kind of like a curtain to kind of give you a ground track of where the rocket is. You can see the rocket's drifting, it's drifting. It, Uh-oh, it looks like it's going towards water and it lands in the puddle. Um, so I did not have dual deployment turned on here for some reason. 
because we should have had a, um, our drogue chute popped out. So I think I know what happened. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> that's the teaser all you get for today. <laughs> Let me just check my uh, Facebook feed here, see if there's anything else. Scott Warner says, Outstanding, I will be using your dual deployment conversion kit, part number 0569. So what Scott is saying, if you go to the Apogee website and you type in that part number, uh, 10569 in the search key, and it will bring up the dual deployment conversion kit. And so the dual deployment conversion kit is specifically made for four inch diameter rockets. And what you get is you get the payload tube, you get the bulkhead, um, the bulkheads, the, the eBay sled, the switch band. Um, what else do you get? Look at this picture right here. You also get a drogue parachute and a Nomex chute protector. Um, so basically this is great for the Zephyr and a lot of people ask for it um, specifically for the Zephyr uh, because they didn't want to do the upgrade and buy the per Peregrine, <laughs> which is fine. Um, if you want to get right into dual deployment, get the Peregrine first. Um, it will save you some money. Um, and then if you want to fly it as just a single deployment, just take the dual deployment conversion kit right out because you don't have to fly it with it. Um, just attach the main parachute right to the nose cone, just like you would on a Zephyr. Leave all this out. Fly it to get your level one, and then if you want to do uh, dual deployment, then just stick it on top of the rocket, and now you can fly it as dual deployment. So that is going to be a wrap for today's episode. Um, you can see down at the bottom is our, our URL for, rock, for Apogee Components. Um, if you come to the Apogee website, if you go to the home page, um, click on the home page button. There will be a sliding banner bar at the top. One of those is for RockSim. Uh, just click on that and that's how you, you can get a hold of RockSim so you can do what I did today. The only thing that you're not going to be able to do is that RockSim Pro at the very end. Um, that is still a teaser. It's coming. When's it coming? Soon because <laughs> I don't have a date yet, but we are actively working on it and we're closer every day to getting that released. So thank you for coming. Um, if you have any questions, um, just come to the Apogee website, click on the button right there that says contact form. You'll find it on the right side of the screen, right under the picture of Michelle. Um, it says contact us. Um, and then on our contact form, you can write your questions and then we do answer our email. Um, you'll be amazed how fast your email gets answered. Um, so that's how you contact us. Um, so now we're going to quit. Um, and so now I got to go over here and find the button that says to end the live feed. And they always hide it on me. Uh, so in three, two, one. <laughs>